Hey folks, Krusty Old Marine here. Today we're going to dissect what is the best method of load development or determine is that just a fairy tale? Is there even such a thing as a best load? Or are we just looking for a load that best meets our needs in the areas of being safe, reliable, consistent, and meeting the performance parameters that we've set? Now, here's my disclaimer. I am not the expert. I've been shooting for 40 plus years, including my 10 years in the Marine Corps. I've been shooting competitively and precision reloading for a couple of years. There is, are some original works and methods that I'll present within, but most of it, it's stolen. It's not really stolen. We borrow it. We work on the work of others who are probably a whole lot smarter and more experienced than me. But you know, isn't that what science is all about? You take the work that someone's proven before, put the theories to the test, and build on them. Also, any numbers, methods, or data that you glean here, those were my results in my rifle. That doesn't mean they're going to work for you. It might not even be safe in your rifle and your reloading methods. So, do your due diligence, educate yourself, and always, always practice safe reloading habits, firearm handling, and, you know, basic firearm safety skills. The problems we face with the load development are that we want to maximize our range time and our components and resources. We don't want to falsely identify a great load only to find out later when the conditions change, you know, that we're off the rail somewhere or in the ditch. And we want to get there in the least amount of time and shots. So what are the methods that we're looking at? Well, you have the one shot ladder or slash sweet spot method. You have the OCW or the optimal charge weight that was pioneered by Dan Newberry. We have the vertical deviation method, which is multiple load shot ladders. You shoot these in a round robin fashion, and this is used by many F class and bench rest shooters. We're looking for which charge weights give us the least amount of vertical deviation in two to 10 shots, whatever you choose. We have the old three shot group, five shot group, 10 shot group. You know, do those work? I don't know. Some people like the, you know, what gave me the best SD and extreme spreads. That's, that's another method. And we have the OBT or optimal barrel time. And with that, you're going to have to use some predictive software such as quick load or Gordon's reloading tools. That's six methods. I have the GRT, Gordon's Reloading Tools software, and full disclosure, I didn't get it until after I had already done this test. I had looked at Quick Load, I was going to buy it, but you can't just download it. You have to buy the CD. My computer doesn't have a CD player. I want to spend another 20, 30, 40 bucks for an external CD drive. I found out about Gordon's Reloading Tools that you can download it for free and uh, kind of back engineered everything. I put all my parameters in there. And we'll see how that load matches up to the other methods. If you aren't familiar with one or more of these methods, we'll cover them a little more in depth as we go through. And you may be familiar with it, but just know it by a different name. You know, those are the names I got. They may not be accurate. You may call it something else. I wanted to work up a load for my service rifle with Ramshot Tack, Lapua Brass, and 77 Green Sierra Match King Hollow Point Boat Tails. I'll also say that we'll have to consider that this service rifle setup was last zeroed at 50 yards and I shot the test at 100 yards. Why was it zeroed at 50? I like to zero at 50 uh, when I'm getting an optic set or something. Um, at my bench rest range, it's we've got a 50, a 100, and a 200. Always a lot of shooters. It takes a long time to go out 200, change anything, walk all the way back, and everybody's always wanting, hey, can we go cold for a little while? It's a pain in the butt. So 50 is a whole lot easier to work with. You get hardly any wind deviation. You get nice tight groups. Um, I think it works just as great. And a 50 yard zero is very, very close to a 200 yard zero. You're only going to be a few tenths. You're only going to be a few tenths MOA difference. One MOA max. So 50 and 200 are real close together. So we talked about all the methods and which one's the best to use. I have no idea. That's why I decided to combine them. I was going to test every method. We'll look at them, we'll combine them, put them in a spreadsheet, make some graphs, see how it all works out. What I did was, I think it was a total of 42 rounds, including four siders. I had uh, 11 different loads 
loaded up. I had seven rounds each. I knew I wouldn't shoot all seven at, I knew I wouldn't shoot all seven at each charge weight because like, you know, I started out at 22.8. I knew 22.8 was, nah, it was not going to give me the load that I wanted. I was looking for something that was going to give me around 27.50 feet per second with a 77 grain. So, when I loaded all that up, all the testing, that's what we got right there. That's sort of a mess, ain't it? It's really not as big of a mess as you think. Right now, it kind of looks like chicken scratch, but you know, when we dive into it, it's going to make a lot more sense. I got all that stuff loaded up, and I wanted to wait for a great day to go shoot. The day I picked, it was supposed to be a beautiful day, up to about 70 degrees, and 70 degrees is where I wanted to shoot. Got out there early because, like I said, my bench rest range is always crowded. It's always a pain in the butt to shoot on it. Um, and it was in the upper 50s. And it was supposed to get really windy that afternoon. Winds up to about 35 miles an hour. So I was lucky to get all my testing in prior to the wind getting real, real high. And I ran, I ran my loads from 22.8 up to 25.5 grains attack. Now, before some of you say that, oh, that was way over max because most books published, I think it's around 23.5, 23.6 as the max load for tack in a 223. I'm not shooting a 223. I'm essentially shooting a 5.56. My service rifle is chambered in wild, and the wild chambering will go up to the higher NATO pressures of a 5.56. I also found that Nosler had load data that they had done on 77 grain bullets all the way up to 27 or 27.2. So those are pretty high pressures. And as you're going up, always start from low to high. And when you start getting to those higher points, look for look for pressure signs. I didn't get any pressure signs until I got to 25. 25.5 actually, uh, 25.2 and 25.5, those were both compressed loads and we'll see how they performed. So first let's look at the one shot ladder slash sweet spot test and see what it gave us. So this is the one shot ladder test slash sweet spot method. Uh, like I said, it's a graph you fire one shot. You're just looking at the velocities and see where you have a leveling off spot or an actual decline in the velocities um this since this test is 100 percent a on a velocity graph there's no need to even show a target or how it worked out on there uh that would also take a lot of time and a break in the fire and going cold on our bench uh one thing you do have to do with this is you have to go out and verify if you choose one of these uh, spots you know a buddy of mine on a marine corps league shooting team he swears by this method um, he totally loves it. Now that said, he's probably a lot smarter than I am and he's a much more experienced reloader than I am. Um, me, I've always contended that this is a statistically insignificant test because you're taking data from only one velocity. Now how the method works is that you're looking for that flat spot. Um, you know, we've got a few of them in here. Uh, there's one between 23, two and 23.4 right in there there's also another one between 23.7 and 24 uh, velocities actually dropped right there and one between uh, 24.6 and 24.9 grains right here again i don't know how you would uh, choose one of those I, I think this theory came from some french dude named crate naudette and I've never heard of him. I don't know if any of you have. So uh, I don't know how great this method is. There's a lot of people who use it. It's a down and dirty quick method to uh, find a spot. Um, we're going to see how this compares later. One reason I say it's statistically insignificant is when you just pick out the a three-shot average on that velocity and run it, you can see how linear this line becomes. It is next to impossible to pick out this those same flat spots that one right there between 23.7 and 24 uh it stands out but look how big it was there obviously it's going to stand out and if you did it on a five shot or a 10 10 shot i'm going to say you would never even see a flat spot in there so anyway let's move on to the vertical deviation method now what the vertical deviation method does it's measuring how far 
the vertical spread is in between each round of each load. We fire these in a round robin fashion and about two minutes of cooling time in between each shot. So, you know, every shot at every load, it has an equal chance to, uh, you know, experience the same fouling or be the least affected by the fouling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in reality, we have two things going on here. Uh, one is that perhaps your reloading wasn't so good and you got high SDs and spreads uh, affecting the, be uh, the vertical deviation. And two, the load isn't a good match for the harmonics vibration of the barrel you're shooting it out of. Um, that goes, the, the harmonics and vibration, that goes back to the OBT method or optimal barrel time. In fact, I would say that the vertical deviation method, you know, I think it probably 100% mimics what the OBT method does. The OBT just allows you to predict through theory and predictive software where that point's gonna, gonna be the vertical deviation uh, load development method that just probably solidifies it. I think it's the two sides of the same coin. Anyway, let's take a look at the target on the wall and see what it says our best load is by vertical deviation. So like I said, we fired all of these at a round robin, meaning that, okay, I fired one at 22.8, then one at 23, one at 23.2, uh, 23, four, so on and so, so forth till I got up to 25, five, about two minutes between each, uh, shot. And then we started again. You can look at the groups here, quite a bit of spread on the 22, eight. Um, what we're shooting for here is the vertical deviation method. So we can see right here that 24, nine, that was the very best we had in the least vertical spread. That was the smallest vertical spread group. It had, uh, uh, it was 0.351 on the vertical. And actually from 24.9, 25.2, and 25.5, they, they were, 25.5 um, kind of went off the rail. 25.2, that was our second smallest vertical deviation spread. But you can see everything's getting real flat right here. Um, the third best that we had in vertical deviation was this 24.3. And on that one, we had um, 0.432 on the vertical. Um, <clears throat> like I said, the uh, we'll see it later. Uh, I saw pressure signs at 25.5. Uh, didn't Did not see any at 25.2. Both of those were compressed loads, however. And then when we get to the uh, OBT method with the... Uh, uh, software modeling, uh, we're starting to run into pressure issues here, especially when the temperatures rise. Go check out Keith Glasscock's video. Uh, dude's a champion F-class shooter, engine engineer. <clears throat> so he's got a really smart mind and he kind of overcomes the insignificance of this test by doing some statistical modeling using a random number generator, knowing what the, uh, um, velocities are going to be and the SDs and ESs and, uh, you know, with thousands of rounds of modeled predictions, then, uh, yeah, he can narrow it down pretty well. So next up, let's take a look at the OCW or the optimal charge weight method. This is Dan Newberry's, uh, baby. He pioneered it and he even has, uh, some associated copyrights on, on it. Uh, you can go check out some of his work over at bangsteel.com. And I think if you, Send your data in. He will tell you what your OCW is if you if you can't figure it out. Um, basically, how the method works, he says that there will be a specific amount of powder that will cause the bullet to exit the muzzle at the friendliest portion of the vibration cycle. Uh, and at that point, will show up in between two other groups. So that sounds a lot like the best three-shot group, doesn't it? I think it's more of an alternative method of coming up with the same information that the OBT uh, predictive software uh, calculation does for you. Uh, but Dan's OCW method works better in that you can prove it on paper. And in theory, it doesn't take too many rounds. It takes, you know, a few three shot groups. But anyway, let's go see how this method works out on the chicken scratch board. So in Dan's uh, OCW method, we kind of have two groups here. Uh, 24, 9, 25, 2, 25, 5. 
we have a group right there in the middle, a 25-2, that winds up real close to the same impact point as we see in the one above and below it. In fact, that one right there, 25-2, is the closest in point of impact than any other, you know, to the two beside it than any other uh, ones on the target. Uh, we also have this group right up here. I'll cover real quick too. I've got this called as a type four node and this one as a type one or two node. Um, and that meaning, that meaning this circle of three groups here. And that's another thing I got from Glasscock in that, uh, okay, a type one node is just a average everyday run of the mill. It, it shoots good. Nothing special about it. A type two node, uh, that's, he equates that to, that's more like a, uh, production sports car. It's going to give you a lot of great performance, but uh, if you're not careful with it, uh, you know, it can put you in the ditch. A Type 4, he says, is super high performance. Equates it more to a top fuel dragster, but uh, if you're not careful with it, you know, you may blow up the engine. Um, as an analogy, I don't think he means like blowing up your barrel, but you know, what he means is that if the conditions change very much, this thing is going to go all to hell. Um, and we know this is at the upper end where we're seeing pressure signs here and the velocities are way up there. But anyway, if we look at Dan's OCW method here on the 24-3, actually, if we look at this one and look at the difference, we center each group and then say, okay, how far was that point of impact away from like this point of impact, that one's point of impact. And actually that one is only, uh, half an inch difference in the point of impact between this group and these two groups. So according to the OCW method, that, that would be an OCW node. Um, while we're up here, let's talk about three shot group, um, analysis. This one, 24, three, that was also the best three shot group. That one gave a group of 0.384, uh, inches or, uh, 0.384 MOA. So, well below half an MOA. These two groups, um, that one was a group of 0.593 and that one was a group of 0.4565. We also had pretty good groupings down here in this, uh, I'm gonna call it a quasi OCW. Uh, we had good groups down here, but uh, it kind of started going off the rails when we got up here to 25.5. That group was actually 1.33. You can see those two shots were really good. And then this one's like, holy crap, what happened there? So ultimately we see up here that uh, in the OCW method, 24-3 lies right between these two. It's a great three shot group. Um, I think that's uh, a load that we have to look at further. Actually, let's go into the uh, GRT software and see what it predicts 24-3 is gonna give us. So, like I said, I ran this uh, GRT modeling after I did all the other tests. Um, I ran it for 60 degrees uh, with my load data and uh, wanted to see what 24-3, which was, you know, we had a lot of things intersect right there, our three-shot group, the center of an OCW uh, node, and we had a great, uh, we were great on vertical deviation there. Um, I don't think that 24-3, did we have anything there that, uh, worked out as a, no, yeah, well, nope. Um, yeah, we did have a little bit of a flat spot right there between the one shot velocity ladder between, no, I'm sorry. So did we have anything there? Well, we had, uh, no, we had nothing there. Uh, that was still climbing. There was not a one shot velocity node showing on 24.3. Maybe drop down a little bit at 24.1 uh, would be a node. But anyway, let's go back to this. Um, so at 60 degrees and 43.3 grains of powder, it said that we should have a velocity, it predicted a velocity of 2741.3. That was close to the 2750 I, I was after and figured would be a good fit. And it's also well within the predicted uh, pressure tolerances with no cautions until we reach uh, 
24.9 and uh, 25.5 showing uh, excessive pressures. <clears throat> what I actually got right there was 2,814 and a half feet per seconds from the lab radar. Faster's better, right? Well, maybe. And we showed no pressure signs there at 24.3. Also, if we take and analyze that load at 110 degrees, let me pull that picture up. So if we take, <clears throat> so if we take and analyze that load at 110 degrees, still at our 24.3 grains of powder, um, we're approaching the caution, uh, which we're going we're gonna to hit at uh, 24.9, and we're approaching the caution, which we're going to hit at uh, 24.6, according to this, and that's a, a caution on the pressures. Uh, we're, we're still below it at 24.3, and then uh, we reach max pressures at 25.2. So, like we saw that other node in the uh, chicken scratch board over there, 25.2, even though it shot really flat and shot good, that would not be a good choice for us. Also, we see a prediction of 2,780.9 feet per second, and just below the caution load of 24.6. As a side note, we can see, according to the predictive modeling anyway, that a change of uh, only 39.6 feet per second, we got over a 50 degree temperature increase. Uh, so that equates to 0.792 feet per second for every degree of Fahrenheit of temperature rise we have. So it uh, looks like TAC is a pretty stable powder, uh, according to this. Some people have said it's not, but right here, I think that's pretty stable. Anyway, but what we're really looking for in the OBT method and predictive modeling is that point where the barrel harmonics or vibrations match the muzzle to the chamber upon firing and exit. So does 24-3 match? Well, I ran that. It doesn't match exactly. Let's take a look at uh, that image. If we look at that, what you do, you go in here and you run... What you do, you go in here and you say compute compute node charge adjustment. And so for the parameters we had uh, up here at 60, 60 degrees, uh, it's, it's disappeared off this chart. But anyway, for 60 degrees, 2,741 feet per second, 23 point, or 24.3 grains, what we're looking for. It says that your OBT or optimal barrel time is going to be 24.21 grains. So a little bit lower, but that's really dang close. Let's see what it looks like when it gets hot at the uh, 110 degrees. So when we're at the 110 degrees, we still got that 24.3 uh, charge weight. We compute a OBT on that and it comes out to 23.86 grains. So even lower. And uh, again, we start to see our cautions at uh, 24.6. Anyway, 24.035 grains lies right in the middle of those temps for our best OBT according to the predictive modeling software. So is 24.035 our best charge weight? I don't know. Let's go look at the target. So the uh, 24, 24.3 and the 24.6 grains all fell into an optimal charge weight three group pattern. It wasn't the best one, but the best one was down here at uh, actually 25.2, we had 0, 0.0 from uh, difference from point of impact between these two. That was the best OCW right there. We saw that we're gonna get pressure issues when it gets hot. So that's probably not our ideal load. So let's talk about the SD and ES as we haven't covered that method yet. The 22.8 was the best SD. Uh, it was three shots and um, you know, it, it didn't intersect with anything else that we tested for a uh, uh, best load, best load development. Our next best was 24.3 with a SD of 11.28 and change and a spread of 33. And we actually did six shots of this because I had, I had some verification ones that I did down here that we'll cover that in a minute. Uh, like Glasscock said, SDs and ESs are statistically insignificant. They'll balance out over hundreds or thousands of rounds, provided you know you've got halfway decent uh, loading methods. And we can al always fix or better SDs and spreads in our loading process. 
I think they're worth considering here uh, since I'm trying to do all methods and see where they intersect. Let's go back to the computer and look at the uh, graph. So here's a graph of convergence of the SD, uh, the group size, and velocity. Now, I took the group size and I multiplied it by 48 because we're looking at extremely sm small numbers here. And we want to see, you know, we had to make them big enough so that they would intersect with the uh, um, SD and the grains of powder. Uh, on the velocity, I divided that by 100 because we're looking at, say, 2,800 feet per second. Uh, divide that by 100, it gets us down here in the 28. So the orange line is our group size, the blue line is our SD, the gray line is the grains of powder, and the yellow is velocity. And we can see that we start getting everything really close down here at 24.0 grains of powder, and then it starts rising and it comes back to uh, um, everything intersecting here at uh, 24.9. It's a little bit, you know, it goes off the rail between uh, 25.2 and 25.5. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit, uh, deceiving in that, okay, since the group size is the orange line, our smallest group was right here at, uh, 24, three. That also happened to be our next to smallest SD. Um, we know what the velocity was there. And, uh, I also did that in a bar graph that stands out better to some people. And we can see that 24, three right here is really good. Also down here, I have a velocity versus just group size. Um, there again, well, we've got an intersect right here, but it's misleading because just because it intersects doesn't mean it's great. If we see right there, the lowest group is at 24.3. Uh, it's a clear winner, and 24.3 was the uh, smallest on the target, uh, smallest group at 0.38. Um, so a lot of things intersected there. Let's go back to the chicken scratch board for a minute. Um, I could see a lot of this data converging uh, when I was doing the test. I didn't have to come home and put everything into a uh, spreadsheet. So I had enough rounds that I wanted to fire like a three shot verification group. I uh, shot one at uh, 24, three, one at 24 grains and one at 24, nine. I should have shot one at 24, six. Uh, why I didn't, I don't know. But anyway, on this 24.3, we can see the group size of that is 0.5695 versus the group size up here, which was 0.384. I'll show you a photo of this one overlaid on this, but those two groups combined came out to be 0.47675, and that's less than a half MOA, which is pretty decent for a semi-auto gas gun. So what are your thoughts on which one is the optimal load? Which one would you choose and why would you choose it? Leave your answer in the comments. Um, how do you like how I combined all the different methods? Do you think that I could have found um, an optimal load uh, just by using one method and which method do you think that would have been? Um, also, I'm not gonna tell you which load I'm going with. That's for you to figure out. Shouldn't be too hard, but I'm not gonna tell you because number one, Big Brother YouTube doesn't like it. And number two, like I said in the disclaimer, I'm not going to do your work for you. You do it for yourself because your mileage may vary. Uh, if you have a different method of finding an optimal load and would like to share it, please do so in the comments. Uh, we're all here to learn and it's valuable information, but uh, I couldn't find any other method. And I don't personally know of any other method. So... I hope you all found this test and information as fascinating and as interesting as I did. Maybe you find it boring. I don't know. Anyway, I appreciate you tuning in. Please like, subscribe, comment, and share. And remember, kids, X's win matches. Keep the greasy side down. We'll see you next time.